Hi everyone, this is Rafi. I'm here with Aaron uh, Blaisdell, a researcher at UCLA. Hi Aaron. Hello, nice to meet you Rafi. Yeah, nice to meet you. So this is the first time we've we've spoken over over Zoom and I've been an admirer of your work for a few years now and you're the I think president and founder of the Ancestral Health Society is that is that correct? I'm one of the two founding members, um, and Brent Pottinger is the other founding member. Uh, he's not involved in the organization at this point. Uh, I'm currently vice president of the organization. Right, right. And uh, yeah, so we have a lot of, uh, I think, common interests, whether it's the paleoanthropological angle and the uh, behavioral and sort of metabolic consequences of food refining that I think are are two really big, uh, big important topics. So yeah, just your research came across my, my, my desk again, I'd seen it a few years back and really renewed some interest in the, 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 the quest for defining food processing and really understanding uh, what, it's, what it's doing to us. Um, so maybe if you, wanna, if you wanna flesh out that introduction and then just tell us what, what those two big ideas are all about, paleo and uh, food processing. Ah, okay. So just a couple of things, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the backstory is that I've been in research pretty much my whole life since college. I started doing research. I went to uh, my undergrad was at Stony Brook on Long Island, the State University of New York. And I was an anthropology major. So I actually got a large dose of paleoanthropology um, and human evolution. And so I kind of had that in my, um, it, it's kind of like where I was coming from academically, what I, what I was really interested in. And so I won't go into the whole story, but basically over the course of going from an undergrad at Stony Brook to a master's program at Kent State University in Ohio, to then doing a PhD at Binghamton University in upstate New York, so back to New York, I had shifted from being interested in human evolution, primate evolution, the fossil record, to studying cognition and the mind in, in living, obviously, in living animals. Mm -hmm. So that was, seems like a big shift, but there was actually, it was a, a logical series of steps along the way, but it kind of shifted me in a very different direction research-wise to more the neuroscience uh, psychology field. And so that's when I came to, when I came to UCLA, where I'm now since 2001, in the faculty in the psychology department, I've been doing psychology research. Uh, I have a rat lab. I know you work with rats too. Uh, pigeon lab. I even study humans, uh, human cognition, things like that. And even hermit crabs sometimes. So right. kind of a wide variety of different species. But always in the back of my mind, I always, you know, I, I teach a course in evolution, actually. I teach a course on evolution in terms of the evolution of, of uh, behavioral processes, uh, comparative um, psychobiology is the course. And so I've always had in the back of my mind the human evolution side and the evolutionary angle on life in general. That's always been a real passion of mine. And so I teach about that. And it was just coincidence working with a collaborator of mine at Berkeley who studied rats as well from a psychology perspective that I all of a sudden came across these ideas of primal and paleo and low carb. Uh, and uh, of course, many people have their story as, oh yeah, I first got into low carb uh, paleo because I read Good Calories, Bad Calories by Gary right. Tobbs. Well, that was also how I got right. introduced <laughs> to the whole topic. And that opened up, opened up so much, uh, a, a shift in my perspective on my own health and global health. And so that's kind of common to many stories, but because I was a cognitive researcher and because of my own personal health journey, which we could talk about uh, shifting to low carb paleo, I discovered not only that it helped with like GI stuff um, and other real amazing health uh, benefits, it also um, led to a much better functioning mind and brain, my cognition improved. Uh, I used to be, I probably had a, 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 what do they call it? reactive hypoglycemia, like after the midday meal, I get real sleepy, I need to go take a nap. Of course, I was eating a lot of carbs back then, and mm -hmm. that's pretty common. 
And so all of a sudden I realized through dietary changes, especially getting rid of the junk, all that processed and refined food, I can improve my cognition. And I'm hearing other people talk about the same thing. It wasn't getting much attention in science, in academia, especially the idea about processing and what effects processing per se of our food has on our health, both metabolic health and cognitive health and everything. So because I had a rat lab and I study rat cognition, how rats think and learn and remember things, I thought, you know, why don't I do a study where I put some rats on a re really refined diet and other rats stay on their control, more healthy diet, more whole foods based, and look to see if there are any differences in cognition. And that's where those two papers that I've already published on this topic have come from with my forays into nutrition research from the angle of the effects of refined foods on cognition. Right. Yeah. So I, I can see how the the evolutionary lens can really sort of highlight a lot of different things. Um, you said it sort of made you think about the cognition and the neuroscience aspect of it all after you have a better understanding of maybe where we came from as humans. And I really share that very, that, that similar passion. Um, actually, even before I was, I got into nutrition, my, my dad used to read a lot of uh, paleoanthropology uh, stuff. And I always found it fascinating, mm -hmm. like the caves in Lascaux and seeing this, the sort of life that they, they, yeah. they'd, uh, you know, drawn and left behind for us to, to imagine. So I, was, I always had this fascination in the back of my mind, but uh, I was really convinced by the evolutionary framing and the evolutionary lens to, for nutrition because I always felt like the explanatory ratio of that theory was so disproportionately favorable. Like for, you just learn a few basic principles and there's so much you could, you could leverage from, from there on that uh, I was also, I was always very sort of uh, biased towards that, that way of thinking. And, and I think it's paid off to be perfectly honest. And it, it remains sort of an undervalued currency in, in that field. I, I, I sense. Yeah, I agree. I don't know why there's been such a, 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 a a, you know, a pension for ignoring it in the medical field, in particular, and health and medical science. They ignored the evolutionary angle because it's a cornerstone of biology. In the same way that um, Einsteinian theory of relativity is a cornerstone of physics. So you can't be a physicist or an engineer, which is a practicing physicist to some degree, without you know, without realizing everything's built on that fundamental of Einsteinian relativity theory. Same in biology, the Darwinian and more recent types of uh, Evo Devo, evolutionary developmental biology, which has been the big strides in the past 20 years, are the cornerstones of biology. And yet you would think medicine and human health would be built on that. But, and it is, but it's not recognized and it's not and then the, the, the implications are not really um, apparent to many the conventional medical practices. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, such, a, it's such a pity. And I, I sort of, you know, uh, provocating, uh, pr provocatively say that it's, we're, it's kind of like we're in the dark ages of nutrition yet. I think there are so, so many, you know, low hanging fruit questions that we haven't properly addressed because that lens isn't applied more consistently more and more rigorously um but yeah there's there's, there's a lot to say on that but uh, i guess just to return to the pro, pro food processing aspect um i you could kind of see it as an outgrowth of evolutionary thinking because if, as soon as you take that approach to understand what is how like what is our food made of nowadays and how might that be related to obesity and diabetes and all the other epidemics we see you realize that that um, <laughs> I guess it's kind of like uh, porn, where it's hard to define, but you know it when you see it, right? Like processed food, like <laughs> it's hard to define very specifically and objectively yet. We, we're still struggling, but we kind of know it when we see it. And I think um, uh, the, the refining of diets is sort of underappreciated in the power to alter energy partitioning, insulin signaling, uh, and all other sort of measures in, in the body. And in your paper, you mentioned changes in the nucleus accumbens, and I think the striatum um, after a refined diet feeding. So it seems to affect a lot of things. And hippocampus. And yeah, and the hippocampus. And 
it's not immediately clear why it would, uh, because you know processed flour is going to end up as glucose eventually uh, in in the cell or or fructose if it's you know um, um, let's say agave syrup. So it's not immediately obvious how it sort of um, I guess disrupts a lot of this uh, physiology. So maybe you have a, a general overview or introduction to that question you you can give. Yeah, I mean, it's this stuff, this this side of things, the more molecular aspects are not my um, skill set, my where I really have my strong understanding. But I do have a, a you know, like a thirty thousand foot view of mm -hmm. some of the key ways that refining foods affects our nervous system, our brains, and its function. Um, one of those is that there are receptors in our brains, especially like in the hippocampus and probably other areas for things like insulin, leptin, ghrelin, right? These are gut peptides that play a hormonal role in digestion and regulating our eating behavior. These also, these are peptides that also cross the blood brain barrier and have receptor sites specifically for them in memory areas like the hippocampus, in emotional processing areas like amygdala and learning areas, which is also where it, what it's involved in, and nucleus accumbens also involved in uh, value uh, and reward learning. So these receptors are basically um, there and sensitive. And in the normal functioning context of a, a person eating a, a real ancestral diet, they would be normally regulating memory, learning, and um, food-related behaviors, regulating your appetite and things like that. But if you, have, uh, uh, if you have too much insulin, too much leptin, like in obesity, because leptin is produced by fat cells. And so you have the, the more fat cells you have on board, white adipose tissue, that kind of fat cells, the more leptin you're just continuously pumping into the bloodstream. And the more of it's crossing the blood-brain barrier, and activating these receptors in the brain. And so what you can get is leptin resistance. When a receptor is getting, it's like the uh, you know husband and wife, the longer they're married, the more than the husband tunes out the wife, right? It's like, <laughs> I don't wanna hear anymore. And so he kind of like, it becomes insensitive to, to the, the constant bickering. Uh, sorry if this offends anybody, it's just a cute <laughs> example. Uh, <laughs> so th this is essentially kind of what's going on whenever a receptor is overactivated by too much of a signal, it downregulates its sensitivity, becomes less sensitive. And so we call that um, resistance. It's resistant to hearing the signal, the message. And so refined foods really alter the, um, the amount of signal getting to the receptors to be over inundated. And so they become resistant. And when they're resistant, that means they can't perform their function properly. And then those brain structures like the hippocampus and memory structure is not able to encode memories as well as it normally would or retrieve those memories. Um, and so that's kind of one aspect of how refined foods, um, especially refined foods high in sugars, um, really can dysregulate cognition and brain function. The other side of it, I think that's critical is that we have all of the, our microbiome essentially and that's becoming, you know, that was the big front, wild frontier. Even just 10 years ago, people were starting to talk about it, but it was really not uh, sure. Uh, and in academia, it wasn't getting too much attention. That's changed. Academia has completely embraced this micro, the microbiome of the gut and other areas and how important it is in modulating our health. And so again, refined foods can... Um, damage that microbiome but, or disrupt the balance of the good bacteria and, and other uh, creatures that live in there, um, like fungi, viruses even, that, that maintain a healthy balance. They can shift them into a, a dysbiotic or unhealthy balance. And, that, and then we know that through the vagus nerve and other pathways, the gut talks to the brain. There's a nervous system in the gut called the enteric nervous system, and it talks to the brain. And the dysregulated dis the uh, microbiome from refined foods causes impaired signaling to the brain that can is the second avenue by which a refined foods diet can impair cognition so those are kind of the two big ways from my understanding right. of the science 
Yeah, and so do you think those sort of effects, Bean D8, like rapid uh, after meal mood changes that people often talk about, whether it's they feel kind mm. of depressed or they feel kind of anxious, do you think those are sort of immediate enough to, to, to induce those effects or could that be something else? And now this is beyond what I know for sure, but I would have suspected that there would be both immediate and chronic effects, especially on mm -hmm. things like um, um, anxiety, as I think you brought up. Uh, anxiety is really found to be um, tied to dysbiosis, gut dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are both immediate effects as well as chronic effects. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I noticed in, the, in your 2014 study, um, you, you mentioned that the, the motivation changes that happen to the rats eating the refined diet seemed quite general. And that's kind of profound mm -hmm. if, it, if it bears out for humans, because there's, there's a... a well, there's, I guess, is what, what is it? A stereotype of the lazy fat person. And maybe that would help us understand it as a consequence rather than a result of, of uh, obesity maybe. So I, I wondered what you thought about that. I thought a lot about that. And that's, prob that's what motivated that particular study, that first study I did. And I'll talk a little bit about it just so people can understand the gist of that study. Mm -hmm. It was motivated by something Gary Tobbs had said. Maybe we're not fat because we're lazy, maybe we're lazy because we're fat. And at the uh, high refined foods, especially high sugar diet um, of refined carbs can somehow in, induce obesity itself. We know that many ways it, it does that, but by inducing obesity, obesity then can induce laziness or uh, a reduced motivation to do effortful tasks. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we studied in that first paper. I just took an, a regular strain of uh, outbred wild type rats um, and uh, uh, long Evans rats, which are make great pets. If you go to a pet store and <laughs> see pet rats there, that's one of the species or one of the strains of rats they use because they're they make wonderful pets. They're really smart, curious, friendly. So we took some of those rats and maintained them on their normal diet of lab chow. And the lab chow really is close to what an ancestral rat diet would be. It's even got ground fish meal, so they're getting good omega-3s mm -hmm. in there. Um, it's got wheat that's been ground. Um, so not like a refined wheat flour, but wheat kernels that have been ground and mixed in there. And for rodents, especially rats mm -hmm. and mice, they're pretty well adapted to eating seeds they're, yeah. they're, to a large degree. So for them, this is the ancestral rat diet, right. not good for humans, but this would be great for rats. And that was the point mm -hmm. of the study, not to show that, oh yeah, if you feed these same diet to humans, they'll be okay. And if you feed this right. to humans, they won't. No, this is a rat study. So we're looking mm -hmm. at what's ancestral for a rat, their lab diet that we normally use turned out to be a really good candidate for that. In comparison to that, we put another group of the same strain of rats mm -hmm. on a refined, low fat, high sugar diet. And both diets were roughly matched in the ratio of fats to proteins to carbohydrates. And because we, what we wanted to do was try and hold those variables constant as close as we could and manipulate how refined the diet was. Just to question about how is processing and refining of foods affecting health. And so the, re, the refined diet led to the rats becoming obese. Within two months, they were, um, completely uh, past the other rats in terms of how heavy they were. Um, and I can always pull up numbers from the papers if you want, but they were, they were basically in a range that we would consider obese. <clears throat> and so then after they had reached that state, I put them into an operant chamber, a little operant box where they had a lever and they could press the lever and earn food reward. And so the food was actually sucrose. So it was like a sweet food. Uh, and so I put the two rats, the groups of rats on this task where initially they just pressed the lever and every time they press the lever, they get a food reward. Then what I did was I shift to something called a progressive ratio schedule. And this has been used, for example, in the pharmacology research, uh, people studying drug effects on, on, on cognition and motivation. It's a really great way to assay motivation because this is how the task works. You put the rat in the box, the lever is put in there, it goes over to press the lever to start getting its food. They press the lever 
let's say three times, okay, they get their food. And if it's a progressive ratio three schedule, then after getting the first food for three lever presses, to get the next lever food, they have to do six. And then to get the one after that, they have to do nine. So it keeps increasing by three progressively. So it's a progressive ratio three schedule. And, and then at 12 and then 15. And so at some point they're gonna stop working. They're gonna be like, oh, it's too much effort to get the next reward. I'll have to put in like 30 or 90 lever presses. And they're like, forget about it. I'm, I'll just go mm -hmm. do something else. So they, they'll no longer be motivated to work that hard. So what we could do is compare the two groups of rats on these two diets to see when do they reach that breaking point, that point in which they kind of give up and stop working. And the earlier they reach it, the lower their motivation. So this is, a, this is a good assay for how motivated they are to work for that food reward. And we saw that the breaking points were much lower for the rats, on, the obese rats on the refined diet. Uh, they were giving up sooner or taking much longer breaks before starting the next schedule to get the next reward. Uh, and so that was uh, showing that the obesity induced by the refined foods diet did cause impairment and motivation. But then you were asking me, it was that you were saying that this was a, actually a general impairment in motivation and wasn't specific to a food reward. So we mm -hmm. thought, well, maybe they're getting a sweet diet Maybe they're not as motivated to press for a sugar reward because they get sweet diet anyway. So sugar isn't as motivating because it's so ubiquitous in their di daily diet. Uh, whereas for the other rats on the refined, on the, on the whole foods diet, I should say, they were, th that was much lower in sugar and not very sweet tasting. So maybe for them, the sugar is a special treat. And so maybe right. that's what drove them to work harder. So we thought, well, okay, that's a confound. It, it, could it be the effects of obesity or could it just be the effect of the how regular sugar was and how much they like it? So that's why we then made them water restricted to see, we repeat the same progressive ratio schedule, but to work for water reward. So there's nothing sweet about it. Then both groups should be equally motivated to want to drink water when, they're, uh, when they've been a little bit restricted from it. And we found even for working for water, the the obese rats on the refined diet gave up sooner. Were less that's fascinating. Motivated. That's fascinating. And that's really clever, really clever study design. Uh, I think that's really cool. And it's kind of scary to think that it can mess with your willingness to, to quench your thirst. I mean, at least it did in these rats. That's, it's maybe not that surprising once you think about how alien water is to some people that they barely drink it they always have something that's <laughs> sugary or flavorful and and yep. when they start drinking water they're like how much do i drink i don't know should i keep sipping on something all day or should i have a ton of water in one go and you're like wow maybe they or really it doesn't are taste right or it doesn't taste right which is so hard to believe given that it's, it's water. Like it should, I mean, you can have bad tasting I water, know. obviously, but it's, yeah, that was, so that was really surprising to me. And yeah, uh, so, that, so that kind yeah. of, I'm sorry, just to interrupt that, that kind of vindicated in a way what Tops had been saying all these years mm -hmm. about, you know, really it might be the causal arrow of what's causing what laziness versus obesity we might have been talking about it in the in the wrong causal direction. Maybe it's right. something about the phenotypic state of becoming obese, whether through dietary and lifestyle intervention factors or even through genetic problems. Once you become obese, it can then be a cause of low motivation, which we view as lazy. Yeah. Do you remember for how long those effects persisted after the, the refined diet? Uh, I did one manipulation in that paper where we reversed the diet. So we switched to diet. So the, right. the rats that were on the refined diet now were put onto the whole foods diet mm -hmm. and the vice versa, the ones on the whole foods were put on the refined diet for just nine days. And then we re-ran these uh, protocols of looking for the motivation. And nine days didn't affect either group. So nine mm -hmm. days coming off of the refined diet onto a healthy diet didn't change their um, low motivation. And the ones that were put that were on a healthy diet and put on a refined diet for just nine days, it didn't impair their motivation. So nine days was not sufficient either way. 
Hmm. Uh, probably if there was a longer period of time, we didn't have the funding to follow up and do this study. But uh, I can imagine if there was a much longer period of time, we might start to see reversals uh, in the two groups. Right. Yeah, because that's interesting with regards to the the addiction problem that a lot of people face when they're trying to, well, the addiction problem. Uh, yeah, I guess it is an addiction problem um, to to find that motivation to make those changes that are, you know, going to reverse that phenotypic uh, uh, issue. And so, yeah, it's, it's really interesting because uh, for some reason, a lot of people dispute that uh, food addiction. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if it has to do with the fact that everyone has to eat, which is different from other sort of addictions, whether it's to our phones or, or other stuff. So I don't know what it is, but uh, I know that Dr. Tro and Dr. Brian Leskies are, are very adamant about, you know, um, sort of taking, uh, taking this head on in their clinical practice where they have to talk about the addictive aspects and pay attention to food texture and maybe cues that you have with food, whether it's social you know, social aspects and, and really work on that food addiction angle. So that finding from your study made me think about the, the importance of that. And I don't know, do you have an opinion on food addiction and, and if we should think of it as we do normal models of addiction or, or if there's an exception there? Good question. Uh, it's a contentious issue to think of food addiction as a, a true addiction. Uh, I have colleagues who study addiction in rodent models and addiction in humans uh, in clinical psychology. And many of them push back on the idea about food addiction as being a truly an addiction by like DSM-4, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Psychopathology and Clinical Psychology. I'll grant that it, it might not necessarily be a true addiction by all the, the standards of a clinical science, uh, at the same time, I think there is good, really good evidence now that it's addiction-like in many ways. Many facets of what is, is involved in a true addiction are present in uh, these kind of diet food addiction um, cases. <clears throat> and for example, there's been some rat studies uh, that have a lab in Connecticut. I forget the person's name. Oh, shoot. Uh, it'll come back to me. Uh, and he's did some work. It, it kind of got made waves about eight, 10 years ago mm -hmm. or something. He did work where he, the, the headlines said something like that uh, reporting on this work, the headlines in the media said something like sugar as addicting as cocaine. Oh, right. Yeah. What, I remember that. what it really involved was the relationship between sugar as a motivator for food reward, uh, it as it compared to cocaine and which one they'll work more for in, in a particular setup in a rat operant chamber. And so he found that the, the rewarding properties of sugar were equal to at least the rewarding properties of, I'm trying to remember, it might, yeah, it was cocaine in his studies. John Solomon, I think was his name. Mm. Uh, and, and so, and he studies motivated behavior using the rat model. And I, and I think he went on record saying, no, no it, it was a, the media took too much of a leap in the way they say, oh, it, sugar is just as addicting as cocaine. That wasn't what he was saying in his papers. Right. What he was saying is that the re reinforcing properties of sugar can be equivalent to the reinforcing properties of cocaine for a rat, right? And so there might be mm -hmm. some implications for thinking about these processes in humans and doing studies to compare that, to understand that better. But there are many aspects of food cravings where you, you might not even be hungry, but you can't stop thinking about food or wanting to grab for something to put in your mouth like a chip or a crisp you know, or something sweet. Mm -hmm. that, that, those, that intrusiveness of, a, of those thoughts, of those urges um, really mirror a lot of what's going on with addiction to drugs and the urge there. So I think there's a lot of a lot of commonality between the two, even if it's not technically, according to many people, a true addiction, it's still close enough that we should, I'm okay with using that language because I think it mm -hmm. gets people on board with understanding how important it is to, to consider changing their own lives to help them. Yeah, and especially if it helps uh, lessen, lessen the idea that people are gluttonous and thus culpable in a sense. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's yeah, hard strong, if you... I have strong opinions you, about that, actually. I think people say, say more. should... 
I think people are too often, their feet are held to the fire about their own behavior. And I think that's, that's an area of research I study is habit learning. Uh, and there's a lot of research in humans and non-humans on habit learning, how we can acquire habits that are very difficult to override. And so when somebody's engaging in a behavior, even if they knowingly are aware that, that it's something that's not ideal or it could lead to bad outcomes, and there's such a problem, uh, such a difficulty in overriding it that it's it's hard to to not give in to it. Like imagine having an itch that you just it's there and you're just trying to ignore it, and, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where you just finally have to break down and scratch it. That's kind of what a, a a really strong habit can be like. And do we blame the person for scratching themselves that they have an itch? No, they had the itch. I mean, it's, there's an urge. Everybody understands that. It's true with our own human behavior that much of it is driven by cues in the environment, patterns of behavior and pathways of reinforcement that we've, been, that we've gone through, that it's, you can't blame the person because they're more like a victim of circumstances than they are mm -hmm. a perpetrator. Right. That, it, it makes me think, I, actually this question of addiction is, is uh, fascinating to me. Uh, I've been long interested in, in the uh, research on psilocybin and magic mushrooms because one of the things that they're now being confirmed to do is actually uh, provide uh, a lot of help to people trying to quit cigarettes. Um, I think the latest figure I saw was there's more than a 60%, uh, um, what would you call it, um, remission rate, people who stopped smoking after six months of a single psilocybin session. I think really? With wow. the, yeah, which is way, way more than what is it? The 20 percent, 20, 15 percent from some with just regular. Or, yeah. And, and therapy, I think in some counseling, maybe something like that. So it's going to be it's going to have to be replicated in bigger trials. But I think they've done a, a, a study that's bigger than a pilot now uh, looking at that. And that's kind of incredible because, first of all, it's one session which is sort of would go against what I would bet on where you need multiple, multiple, you know, like loosening of the knots basically to, to re re pattern, whatever is going on in the brain. And um, yeah, so I was just uh, curious about if you had any thoughts about it, if you knew anything about that research and how it can play into what you were mentioning about addiction. I haven't been following the story too closely, but I've, heard a few podcasts. Tim Ferriss has been very interested in this topic. And mm -hmm. on his podcast, he's interviewed some of the frontline researchers and clinicians uh, involved in like psilocybin and other kind of uh, psychoactive substances um, as a treatment for addiction, for mood disorders like depression, anxiety. I didn't know about the smoking. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I... I know enough that I, I'm intrigued and can believe that there are many, as you said, loosening of the nuts so you can repattern re the brain if, right. and, and the pathways in there. I think that's a good analogy for what it feels like this substance can do. I just remember in college, I tried you know, magic mushrooms a few times and mm -hmm. I thought it was one of the most amazing experiences. For me, it was like, I was of course a very receptive person. I was very open-minded very glass half full kind of person. And those are the kind of people mm -hmm. that tend to with the hallucinogen have a very positive experience and, and right. it lasts a long time in their lifetime. So I, I, I could see that they could be very powerful and I'm, I'm hoping to see them really open up, get away from this not being called a schedule one drug anymore because they shouldn't be. Uh, they're not addictive, um, at least not in the classical way we think of substances as being addictive or habit forming, but they had this profound therapeutic effect that is real. The science, the, the clinical trials have been done are small, mm -hmm. yes, but they're real and very powerful. Yeah, yeah, no, I've, uh, I've had a few experiences myself uh, quite a few years ago now, maybe five, six years ago, but um, it did have a very uh, curious effect where a lot of things that are maybe known uh, consciously, maybe some, some things that you tell yourself, they never quite hit you in the gut to make you take that behavior change step. But with uh, magic mushrooms, it seems that that's, that transfer of knowledge from the brain sort of to the gut, so to speak, is sort of 
uh, made a little easier. At least that's how I, that's how I experienced that. And uh, for me, it just made me get my shit together to, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, but <laughs> Uh, I'm sure for other people, it 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 help it helps them deal with uh, depression, trauma, um, you know, some big life questions. And it was just interesting to think of, um, you know, mushrooms, which are kind of a food in a sense, uh, but also acting as a medicine, helping mm-hmm. with uh, an addiction, a food addiction, uh, one food combating another, uh, so to speak. And I think there's there's a lot to do there in the future, hopefully. <laughs> I hope so. I would love to get some, not just for myself, but actually to see what effect it might have on my rats, um, right. both in just general cognitive processes or even mm-hmm. in cases where rats are in the, um, where you create an addiction in rats. So rats are a really common model for addiction of all types. Mm-hmm. Uh, imagine what can happen if you try to psychoactive substance like, like uh, psilocybin in a rat and and they're, you know, to our knowledge, they're, they're not going to have the same self-reflective, presumably self-reflective kind of experiences about the knowledge of, oh, I shouldn't be doing this, or, or oh, that's where that trauma came from. I could deal with this now. You know, without, you, you're probably not having any of that in the rat model. But if you still see profound effects, we know there's a neurobiological mechanism that could be studied and understood better. And we know that, therefore, it's not just... We're not making it up in our own minds. If it can affect and uh, have similar effects in a rat model, that would be really another step I'd like to see it go. Yeah. That, so this brings up a, a question I have with regards to the work I'm doing in my PhD. So I'm looking at schizophrenia in a rat model, the methyloxymethanol model, which is a you inject uh, the pregnant dams uh, so that the pups grow up with some uh, to, to exhibit some schizophrenic traits, basically, and that's a model we use to see the effect of different drugs like aripiprazole and, and Zyprexa. And, you know, this, of course, the limitations of the model is, is a really big deal. And to understand them is key to producing good research. And one of the, the frustrations I had with this model was that it was good to study the, um, the what we call the, the negative aspects of schizophrenia. They're negative and positive as in things you lose and things you, quote, gain. Um, so, of course, if we're talking about stuff like the uh, hallucinatory part, the auditory or visual hallucinations, well, we're not really able to study that quite yet. But the things you lose, like the social affect. To. Oh, please. Perfect. I was going to say, what, what would you do to improve that? So, so tell me. <clears throat> well, in terms of positive affect, uh, aspects, uh, like hallucinations, um, vividry, uh, vivid imagery and stuff, one of the, my research areas is, or research projects is to study mental imagery phenomena in rats. Oh, now that's wow. a challenge because we can't just ask a rat or any kind of non-human animal. Um, well, there are a few, like a parrot, you can train a parrot to talk and maybe mm. then you can ask it questions about its mental state. But aside from those real weird test case, uh, special cases, rats, you're never gonna be able to sit them on a couch and ask about their day, tell, them, uh, tell us about your mother. But I've created in my lab operant procedures, and I'm, I'm trying to still develop some, to be able to see whether we can get evidence for mental imagery, meaning the rat could be thinking about something, visualizing something in its mind's eye um, that's not physically present in the operant box and have it influence its behavior, and that's the key. But instead of influencing verbal behavior, which is how we'd report mental imagery, it would have to report its uh, mental imagery through by influencing behavior like le- pressing a lever, for example. Okay. So imagine, so, and the way we do yeah. this is, oh, go ahead. No, no, I was going to okay, say, please so tell me way, more how you do that. So the way that, so far, the way we've been doing it, and it's not a perfect way of, of doing this, but it's our initial um, method, is, all right, so let me, uh, let me put it this way, uh, with an analogy to our own lives. Imagine that you've, you are driving to work and every time you drive to work, there's this one, there's an intersection you pass and there are these trees off to the side, but the, the, um, the signal light is right there hanging in the middle of the intersection. And you can always see whether it's red or yellow. Uh, I mean, red or green, occasionally yellow, but red or green. Mm-hmm. You can always see which of those two states it is as you're approaching the intersection. So you're approaching from a distance, you see, oh, the light is red. I'm gonna to come to a stop. 
All right, I get oh, it. I yeah. see it's green. I'm just going to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, imagine one day there's like a big windstorm the night before, and on your way to work that day, you're approaching that intersection, and a big tree had actually got blown over from the wind and is kind of dangling on the, the light, and it's actually covering it. So the light's actually still there, and it's still operating as a light, mm -hmm. as a signal light, but it's covered, it's occluded, and you don't know the state. It's one of two, or well, possibly three states, but it's either green, which means you can go, or it's red, which means you better stop. You don't know. It's an ambiguous situation because the signal is occluded. But you do know other things that are related to that signal. You know, for example, if it's red, that there'll be cars crossing in front of you. You'll see them, the traffic going both ways on the street. So, you, so that's another cue to stop. Mm -hmm. Or if it's green, you'll notice that there's a bunch of cars, but they're all sitting there at either um, light waiting for their turn. So you can use these secondary cues that are associated with the st state of the light as backup indicators for what the state of the light is and whether you should be able to proceed or right. not. So that's kind of the analogy of what we did in the lab. I train rats to learn to expect to get food when they press a lever, when, for example, when two lights are on and there'll be two key lights sitting in the, in the chamber. Uh, and so if the two key lights are both on at the same time, every time they press the lever, they'll get food from a little food hopper. If only one key light or only the other key light is on, so one is on and the other is off, or the second one's on and the first one's off, pressing the lever will not get them food. Over time, they learn this, what they call, we call this a discrimination. They learn to discriminate, their, their behavior comes under the control of these discriminative stimuli such that the lever pressing is high when both lights are on and lever pressing is very low when only one or the other light is on. Okay, they've learned that procedure. They've learned how to discriminate the world, the little states of the world in their operant box and what to do. Now we put them into the box and we have a metal occluder covering one of the lights. Mm. And then we turn the other one on. What's the state of the world? Is it just one light on, the other one's off? They just can't see it because it's occluded? Or is it one light's on and the other one's on, they just can't see it because it's occluded? Now it's ambiguous it could be one of those two states. If they can imagine that the second light that's occluded might be on, then maybe they'll be, they'll, their lever press behavior will be more like a two, both lights trial, which case they should press a lot. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if they just treat it just like it's only one cue, I never get food for that. I can't see what the other one is. And if they don't have this mental imagery of the other light being on, then they'll just respond very low, just like it was a one light, one cue trial anyway right so their behavior is telling you what they're imagining essentially uh it's uh, now it's not a perfect procedure because there mm -hmm. could be other types of accounts that have to then involve memory or expectations not necessarily mm -hmm. true mental imagery but it's getting us closer this procedure is getting us closer to yeah to developing tools techniques to uncover the the, the actual representations in the rat's mind mm -hmm. yeah Oh, that's really interesting. That's 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 quite clever. I like it. Um, has, has so it been there's when already? psilocybin. Uh, yeah, I've yeah. used this just for the what I've just said, and and they okay. do show this at sensitivity. You you cover one light, right. and they act as if it might be on. They're not always acting mm -hmm. as oh yeah, I think they're both on, and they full mm -hmm. force behavior, but they're definitely their behavior becomes intermediate, as if they're thinking, well, it might be on, might not. You know, I better press the lever more than I normally would if it was just one right. light. So they, we have a various evidence, piece of evidence that they are using some process, mental process of, of guessing the light might be on and, and the guide and using it to decide to respond. And more importantly, we've followed up with that work using this behavioral procedure and looked at their brains. And we found that it's the hippocampus that is critical for them to be able to do this. Awesome. So if we temporarily inactivate the hippocampus, which is that memory structure that we were talking about earlier, you temporarily inactivate it, we can infuse, we can have a little cannula that goes into the hippocampus through a surgery. And then once they've recovered from surgery and they're doing their behavior task, we can infuse a little substance in there that shuts down signaling uh, within the hippocampus. And when we do that, then they treat the, they don't, they're no longer treating the covered light as if it might be on. 
they're like, it's, they, they, they don't do this mental imagery process anymore. And when the infusion goes away, like a week later, it's all gone and, and the hippocampus is back and functioning. We test them again and sure enough, they're, now they're able to make that discrimination. Wow, okay, so would that suggest that imagination is sort of like creation of, of memories or, or sort of copying of, of memories? There's great human research showing this to be the case. Um, mm. There's great research using like fMRI uh, and other procedures, which are tools of imaging brain activity in the human brain while they're doing some kind of behavioral cognitive task. And there's a lot of good evidence showing that the hippocampus is active, not just for retrieving memories, but for imagining future possible scenarios. Mm -hmm. So simulating future states, like imagine tomorrow you're gonna do this. Hippocampus is an area that becomes involved in that process. That's, re that's really cool. I'm, I'm looking at the dente gyrus in the, in the hippocampus with, with my rats and trying to look at some neurogenesis uh, mm -hmm. uh, to see if the, if the antipsychotics changed uh, some, cell, some cell populations or if the ketogenic diet did that I gave them. So Ooh, that would be great. Yeah, hopefully I'll be able to, yeah. to say something about that soon. But uh, antibodies are such an annoying assay. That it, it's like trying to do black magic. It, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You have no idea why. It's, it's so annoying. <laughs> are you talking about antibodies for expression, for visualizing? Uh, sorry, the for um, immunohistochemistry. Sorry. Right, right. Okay, you're right. Yeah. Because we did some immunohistochemistry and we found the dentate gyrus of the mm -hmm. hippocampus was the area that became more active oh, on okay. the test trial. On the test trial. So rats mm -hmm. that received this training would discriminate one or the other light versus both. Mm -hmm. Dentate gyrus was not active at test unless one of the lights was covered and then the mm -hmm. other was turned on. Only then did the dentate gyrus become active more than in the other conditions. Okay. So our interpretation um, was that, and that, those results are published in the journal Hippocampus a few years ago. Mm. Our interpretation is that the dentate gyrus is involved in retrieving the memory of you know, the other light being on. So if this light's on, I remember sometimes that light's associated with the other light. So maybe the other light's on and then if the, if the light is uncovered and off, so in one of the test mm -hmm. conditions, like we present light A, one light, and the other light, light B is off. It's not covered, it's just off. So light A would retrieve a memory of light B, but then they look at light B and they say, oh, it's off. So they don't need to maintain that memory. Oh, okay, Whereas right. if we cover light B and we test and we present light A, retrieves the memory, oh yeah, when light A was on, sometimes light B was on, they cannot tell whether light B is on or not because it's occluded by this metal shield. So we're, what we're guessing is that the dentate gyrus remains active in that case only because that's where they're maintaining the possibility of light B being on, that they're maintaining gotcha. the active state of that memory. That was our mm. kind of interpretation of those results. I guess it would be a parsimonious interpretation in terms of how the brain is, is acting. Uh, uh, the, the description seems pretty... Pretty clever. I, I like that's that's really interesting. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so th that when when is when was that published? Just so I can make sure to to look that up. Yeah, that and if email me later, I could always send yeah. it to you. And all my publications are available on my website on my pigeon rat. <coughs> pardon me, on my my lab website, which is pigeon rat. Uh, you just type that in, you'll find it. Uh, or okay, type perfect. my name in, you'll find it. Uh, and all my publications are there, so you'll find it there. I think it was published in 2016, mm. I believe, something around that. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so what are you what are you uh, studying now? Are you are you are you continuing the same the same uh, same vein, or are you looking at something new? Uh, some of both. I'm still doing some work on the mental imagery. In fact, I have an NSF funded mm -hmm. grant to do that. And so I've cool. been working steadily on some of that research um, and trying to devise even better methods of, of figuring out whether we can say that they truly have a mental image or not. Mm -hmm. um, also, I'm studying habit learning. Uh, uh, more importantly, I'm studying a, a model that we've developed of habit learning 
that makes specific predictions about behavior. So we're, we're basically testing a, a model of habit learning, um, okay. comparing it to other models of, of uh, like goal-directed learning, learning where you're aware of what the outcome or what the goal is, as opposed mm -hmm. to a habit, like a habit you do without thinking. Like you step onto the elevator, you press a button, because if that's always the button you press to go to whichever floor you normally go to, you can be conversing with somebody, you reach over, you press the button, you're not even thinking. It's like your habit system is doing it. Right. Whereas if you're navigating to a new building and you have to meet with somebody and they're on a fourth floor and you've never been in that building before, you go to the elevator, you're very goal directed. You're looking, okay, four, okay, four is this one, that's what they're on. You're very, it's in your active mental representation of the goal as is guiding your behavior. As opposed to habit learning, a habit to, to um, habit directed behavior you're doing like on autopilot, so to speak. So we're comparing predictions of that kind of habit learning versus the goal directed in the, mm. some different procedures with rats and with pigeons actually. So would you predict that the habit learning um, mode would correlate with less blood flow, less, less metabolic activity? Because I'm thinking of habit learning as a heuristic and, and the very sort of intense uh, engaged focus of, of um, what did you call it? Sorry, um, uh, the other kind? Goal-directed. Goal-directed, goal-directed goal learning. Yeah, am I thinking mm -hmm. of that in the in the proper way in terms of cerebral intensity or? Not exactly. Uh, it's more about which areas of the brain are active. Mm -hmm. Habit learning requires activity, but of, and they're both involved. Um, they both involve striatum, which are like basal ganglia structures, which are involved in habit or in action selection. And mm -hmm. so, our whenever we're doing actions, planning actions, and carrying out actions. The striatum is a, ser a section of the brain um, that is involved with organizing that behavior. And there are two, there are different pathways within striatum. One pathway is more involved in this goal-directed behavior. Mm -hmm. But as you do that goal-directed behavior more and more and more, uh, it, it starts to shift over to the other pathway, the habit learning pathway. And it becomes a habitual behavior that no longer requires a goal-directed pathway to execute. So it's like we're starting to learn things and then we shift them off to the habit pathway as they mm. become well learned. And right. so we can learn new things and then shift mm. them off to our habit system. So the habit system becomes active when you're doing a habit. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, that, that's super interesting. Is that is that um, what you would call cognitive offloading or, or is that reserved for something else? I've heard that term. I don't know much about the term, but I'm guessing from it sounds like it would be what they mean by that. Uh, I yeah. don't know the context in which that's used. Right, because because it's uh, it's interesting to think about the the intensity, sort of the the focus that that's required when you're learning something new versus when you're just repeating something. Um, uh, yeah, and I, because they're because the brain is such an energy hungry organism, I was wondering if that might be reflected uh, somehow. But may, maybe it's too fine a difference. Maybe mm. it's a difference uh, without a. It's that's just not meaningful. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think even though the brain is a very hungry uh, um, part of the body, uh, I don't think that the, the different types of cognition and behavior we engage in cause dramatic changes in, at, at the level of the whole brain, how much energy mm -hmm. it's using. I think it just shifts which areas is using the energy. Right. And I should I say can easily why, imagine, though, that... Yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I could easily imagine that the habit system is is the structure might be very efficient in the sense mm. that it might be able like goal directed learning it might be more it might take more systems so there oh, more blood flow anyway and more more um, metabolic activity because more systems might be involved and mm. then when it transitions to habit it might become pared down to a more simple system that can that sh uh, you know a more shortcut way mm. of doing the actions so maybe yeah. it becomes more efficient and, and i should say why i'm mentioning that for two sort of tangential reasons. One is that I'd read that uh, people playing chess use up to 6,000 calories uh, in a day from, from playing chess, which is just incredible. That's more than twice or, or three times the, the caloric expenditure of a you know, average sized uh, man or woman. 
So that's quite something. And that's very, of course, mentally engaged. So I guess that would be very goal. Would that be goal-directed learning? Could, would that make sense to apply it there? Or is that a bit too, huh. too much of a stretch? I think it's got aspects of both. Like the rules of chess, mm. the basic moves are habits at that point. I mean, in mm. the sense of like, when you want to do something, you don't have to think as much about, oh yeah, does a, does a knight go to an overall? Yeah. Right, you're not you relearning the rules. Those things yeah. have become, yeah, the rules have become sort of like habitual. Um, reference memory, uh, semantic knowledge, but then mm -hmm. the working memory, like, oh, I've got these pieces here. Those pieces are threatening me. I know mm -hmm. in three moves, I need to do something about that scenario that's unfolding. That's all working memory, even more frontal cortex and everything, uh, that, that part of the, which is a part of the brain that's involved in maintaining your ongoing short-term goals. That's what mm -hmm. we call working memory. And the short-term planning and, um, and and directing the overall activity, decision making. Mm -hmm. So that part of the brain is very. If that's very heavily used, yeah, that is mentally taxing. That mm -hmm. must use more energy, apparently, with the chess study. So it's a mixture. When you, these these expert mm -hmm. chess players are both using a lot of habit learning, but that's efficient. So you don't probably don't see much of right. that. Um, but what you're really going to see is frontal cortex activity. I, I, I would guess. That's interesting because uh, they're also uh, famous for learning tons of chess moves by heart, uh, so they don't have to run through them. And maybe that would that would again offload some cognition. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure it would. Yeah. 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 Um, so I guess just a, a, a changing topic. Is there anything uh, of interest of late in the world of nutrition that sort of caught your attention? I don't know if you're still he heavily interested in, in a lot of nutrition stuff, because I know it can get pretty, uh, pretty taxing sometimes the whole, you know, nutrition debates. So is there anything new interesting that that piqued your interest recently? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't follow it nearly as much as I did 10 years ago when I was just changing my own life and, and getting mm -hmm. into it. And my eyes were open to this, you know, the possibility that what we knew about nutrition was wrong. Um, so I did a deep dive back then and followed a lot of podcasts as well, read the literature. Lately, I haven't really done that because I've gotten into new interests. Mm -hmm. I have to say, though, I've been very intrigued by the carnivore movement. I thought that's mm -hmm. been very interesting. And I was, I've never been carnivore in my dietary approach, although I tend to be very animal foods heavy in my diet and plant mm -hmm. foods light. Um, it's been the way I've been going for the past 10 years. Um, and, and I do really great on that, uh, as many people seem to. But it's really interesting to see how much more knowledge there is about um, meat and other animal products and the nutrition they provide and the help people, the, the, the healing people experience when they cut out plants almost completely. Uh, mm -hmm. That's been kind of cool. I haven't really read a lot or listened to a lot on it, but just enough that it's definitely um, something that's, it's intriguing. And uh, maybe I'll dabble more in it as I, as I get, keep getting mm -hmm. older and maybe and you know the knees start aching more or whatever i might start to shift into that just to to see try it out and see if it'll really work i have followed mm -hmm. um the uh, dent the periodontist al dannenberg um mm -hmm. and his story he uh was diagnosed with cancer like four years ago or so a terminal cancer is expected to live in like oh, for only three or five more months at the time and he started really research and he was already ancestral primal Mm -hmm. And he started really digging into research and finding more experimental therapies. But one thing he's turned on to in the past couple of years is, is a carnivore diet. And he, mm -hmm. and according to what he's written about in this blog has really helped him a lot with managing the, the, the cancer. It's pretty much in remission, not cured, but in like no active states that are noticeable in, in scans. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. So, that's yeah. great. And yeah, he's, he's not the only anecdote out there. My, my good friend, uh, Andrew Scarborough, uh, had, a, had brain cancer years back and has been managing it uh, in large part with a, with a carnivore diet. I think there's a, a, a guy called Pablo who had a glioblastoma as well, and he's still in remission years later. So it's starting to add up. And yeah, it's really interesting mm -hmm. uh, i myself am for the most part carnivore uh, because of some ibd issues i'm i'm trying to manage um but i sort of 
gravitated there very slowly, um, thinking it was crazy, like like everyone initially. But I have to say it piqued my interest uh, academically as well, because uh, I, I have a paper coming out with uh, Mickey Bendor and, and Rand Barkai on the uh, trophic level of humans in the Pleistocene and, and what that uh -huh. might mean in terms of where we position ourselves in the food web, because we've got a lot of... yes recent ethnographic data where we have a lot of i would say more of a typical omnivorous pattern especially because a lot of those population we studied around the tropics so that's quite a different environment than the ice age which sort of characterized a lot of the uh, pleistocene evolution so we make the argument that um the ethnographic interpretations might not be totally applicable to a longer timeline through back in the in the place to scene and and so that that should be out pretty soon and i'll be i'll be curious to to get reaction from people on that because it's it's kind of provocative to say we might be more carnivorous than previously assumed it is a very interesting idea and i'm very partial to that idea i know miki for many years he's come and spoken at the mm. ancestral health symposium many times uh, I think that paper might have just come out because he just tweeted um, this oh, morning, right, yeah. in fact. Yeah, that's his and, and so, Rand's, and we've got another one in, uh, in well, actually, that's okay. been accepted, but not published yet. Okay, I can't wait to see that one, too, because I'm, I'm really, I love these, mm -hmm. these kind of notions because it reminds us that just because we're studying somebody in a, living in a modern-day ancestral environment like mm -hmm. the Hadza or somebody, or the, the Kalahari Bushmen or other groups that we know of, they're maybe not reflective of the true Pleistocene era human evolution um, ecology and, mm -hmm. and the, tr the trophic level we were at because maybe the, so many of the megafauna had been hunted to extinction that we're now on fallback right. animal foods, so to speak. Right, right. And we're making pretty good, we're making do pretty well with those um, as long as we're eating those to tail and getting the right kind of organ meats in there. Um, and so, but the idea that we've lost the birthright, the human birthright of the megafauna, for mm -hmm. the most part, and uh, it's like we're all living in a in a in a secondary environment, uh, even yeah. at the best of times. Uh, it's an interesting and very intriguing idea. Yeah, and it's it's it was really exciting to me in part because I I I think I mean I I realized that it's actually it's also compatible with what we know from the ethnography if you incorporate some more clinical processed foods sort of understanding, because actually I think you can have modern population, uh, you can have humans living on relatively high carbohydrate diets. If, if mm -hmm. you pay attention to the type of fats, the type of refining, the sufficiency of animal food, I think that's actually, you can reconcile all of those observations um, and explain maybe why it's easier for people to live off you know just fat and protein basically which is red meat so that's kind of why it was such an exciting idea for me because i was like okay things are starting to get you know the dominoes are falling basically and we're getting to something somewhat conciliant that makes evolutionary sense um mm -hmm. yeah so hopefully it'll move the conversation forward there i have a piece to add to that too because amber o'hearn who i'm sure you know of um, yeah, yeah. probably cross paths with her She's been writing a lot about this topic as well. She has a book that she's been slowly publishing chapters online mm -hmm. uh, about um, human uh, carnivory as the natural state. Uh, and something, because I'm a comparative psychologist, comparative um, evolutionist, um, something that occurred to me when listening to her arguments is when you do a phylogenetic analysis of different species like carnivores, carnivores for the most part can eat a lot of muscle meat, protein, because they're mm -hmm. really good at gluconeogenesis. Cats can produce a lot of glucose from the protein that they eat, for example, and that can fuel the brain and other metabolic processes, other tissues. Humans are a great ape, essentially. We're one of the many great apes. And if you look at what great apes ate, like modern day chimpanzees and gorillas and even orangutans, what you find is they have a very high um, plant-based diet. Chimpanzees do eat uh, some opportunistically hunted um, vertebrates and they do eat invertebrates like ants and termites that make a, a, an important contribution to their diet. 
but the bulk of the foods that chimps eat and the bulk of the food gorillas eat are <clears throat> fruits, leaves, and shoots. And the kind of fruits that chimps eat are not like apples and bananas. They're not domesticated mm -hmm. agricultural products. They're really high in fiber, very low in sugar. So they're really, what these animals are eating, our closest living relatives are eating tons of fiber from plants. And they have long, um, the, the, the lower intestines are very long, much longer than ours. And what they do is they ferment that and process that fiber as it's going through the hind gut. And what does that produce? I'll ask you, what does it produce as a fuel substrate? For Some the short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids, right? So it, just like cows are doing the same thing, they're, but their front, front foregut fermenters or their rumen is turning all that grass, uh, perennial grass, oh, my dog is here, uh, okay. perennial grass uh, uh, fiber into short chain fatty acids. So cows are on a high fat diet. Mm -hmm. Great apes are on a high fat diet, not a high carb diet. So mm -hmm. if you think about our, you know, only 7 million years ago, we share a common ancestor with chimps. Um, and so if humans split from that ape type of diet to shift to eating animals, they're not gonna turn into carnivores the way cats are and ramp up their ability to do gluconeogenesis and go for muscle meat. They're gonna shift to another source of fat which is what their hindgut was producing in their chimp and gorilla like ancestor. So they're going to find a different way to get fat. And the way you do that is by eating the animal fat. Mm -hmm. And so that makes a, a sense that phylogenetically, the, the easiest ways for humans to become carnivores is not by increasing our ability to eat muscle protein, but are increasing our ability to consume fat directly. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very well summarized. Actually, I, I totally agree. And um, it, yeah, it's it's. Um, I think it's a big deal for the field of paleoanthropology if if that becomes more of a mainstream notion. That's going to be a pretty pretty big change um, mm -hmm. from from what we we had 10, 20 years ago. So I'm I'm really curious to see how that's gonna how that's gonna develop. Uh, and I hope Amber publishes some more books and papers because she she has a lot to say there. It's a very very creative person. She does. She does. Yes. Yeah. I think so, she will be. Yeah. Yeah, so let me ask you a uh, last question, Aaron. So what do you eat today? What it, so what does it look mm. like? Um, you mean in general, right? This morning. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, in general, yeah. <laughs> in general, I tend to, eat, yeah, as I said earlier, I eat a lot of uh, animal foods, um, steaks and liverwurst almost every day. I, mm -hmm. from US Wellness Meats, and they were one right. of the vendors at the very first Ancestral Health Symposium back mm -hmm. in 2011. By the way, we're having, we hope to have on UCLA campus in August, the 2021 10 year anniversary of the Ancestral Health Symposium. So cool. maybe by the time this podcast is even out, uh, the announcement will be out and tickle, tickles will be on sale. In the event that the pandemic prevents us from holding an in-person conference, we're not going to do a virtual conference. I think it's mm -hmm. too much Zooming. So, yeah. and you don't get the real meat, which is the face-to-face mm -hmm. -face interactions of a conference. So we'll just push it off for a year and everybody will get a refund if they bought tickets. So we're safe on that. But we're hoping that we can actually have an in-person meeting this summer. And so basically for the past 10 years, my since, or 12 now maybe, um, since, 20, 2009 or so, really I eat a lot of, I've been eating the liverwurst from US Wellness Meats. Mm -hmm. I ordered that and keep it in the freezer and always have some in the fridge. But I think organ meats are so critical to our ongoing health, including mm -hmm. our dental health and everything. So meats, eggs, soups, we make a lot of soups from bones. Every time we eat ribs, we'll save the bones and make a soup. Uh, nice. We we once a, every few weeks we go to Chinatown. My wife is from China, and we get like Peking mm -hmm. duck. We mm -hmm. save the duck carcass. We make soup out of the duck carcass, which meant you, oh, nice. you're French. You know duck soup. Yeah. Duck is great. <laughs> um, so you know we eat a lot of that kind of stuff. I do some. I eat some vegetables. I eat you know the cruciferous uh, vegetables and salads and things like that. I don't eat any fruit really. I, I do dairy. I like, we get raw milk for the kids. Uh, I'll do cheeses and yogurts and keepers. 
and I do eat starches now and then, <laughs> and I do go off diet now and then. I yeah, because you know I'm able to, so it's All I'm right. happy about that. That's yeah, no res it. resilience is uh, resilience is definitely an aspect of health. So mm -hmm. if pe if people can do that and and feel good, I think you know why not. Um, you know, food is more than than energy. It's it's also you know uh, how we celebrate things, and it's also you know how we what we associate with things from our childhood. So it's certainly a, it's not a, it shouldn't be seen as a puritan thing. Uh, I think uh, even right. if you're on a carnivore diet, you get a lot of variety and fun things to eat. So you know, I think there's there's something for everyone in there. That is very true. Uh, I, I agree that it's a therapeutic tool. I mean, ideally we need so that we're optimal uh, mm -hmm. and feeling great so we can be the best person we can be of ourselves and, and the people around us will love us. <laughs> right. uh, but at the same time, we have to enjoy the things that we want to enjoy. And if we can, we, we can, that's good. Uh, I drink coffee every day, like mm -hmm. three or four cups. Uh, I put um, some uh, I don't do too many supplements, but I will put mm -hmm. the, um, which we call it the collagen peptides yeah. into the, my coffee. And, uh, I do, it. Uh, I do also one other supplement I do is the uh, MCT oil powder, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that I put in Rob Wolf. And he talks about this a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. and he's turned me on to the, the one I do. I'm blanking on the name. I should say the name so I could give them some PR, but uh, if you find Rob Wolf, he's, I think he maybe even involved in her company. I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. it's like, it's great stuff. And so yeah. I don't do too many other supplements, maybe vitamin D now and then. Right. Yeah, no, I don't have too many supplements uh, either. Maybe some potassium, some salt, obviously. Um, that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. I've never found them to be particularly useful for me, but no, my diet's pretty carnivorous with some occasional uh, uh, baking with some almond flour and, and stuff like that. A lot of dairy, because I'm in France, obviously. So cheese is, is as yes. close to religion you as I'm going to get. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have some really disgusting, smelly, delicious uh, uh, dairies to, to get from. Tons of raw, raw <laughs> options. So it's, I'm very yeah. lucky in that sense. You are lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, anyways, thanks for taking the time, Aaron. It was really, really interesting talking to you about about all your research and your your varied interests. So, hopefully, I get to meet you in person someday. If not at the at the reunion, maybe some some other conference. Uh, so, yeah, thanks. That'd be great. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. It was a pleasure to talk about this stuff, and I'm always happy to share and learn from people like you. And if we ever meet in person, which hopefully we'll do soon. Uh, we could even talk more about uh, lab rat research because uh, I like geeking yeah. out on that too. Perfect. Oh, that's perfect. We have something to look forward to then. All right. Well, thank you very much. And then this will be up in a couple hours. Oh, wow. That's quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Bye.